Um, unlike my predecessors, I will not be talking about Latin America in general. I'll be talking about a specific place, Rio de Janeiro. I'm going to do a short summary of situation of violence of the last 30 years and then comments on the present situation. Uh, to give you a bit of context, city uh, of Rio has about 6 million inhabitants, a metropolitan area has uh, over 11 million, and the state of Rio has uh, almost 16 million. One in four to one in five of the inhabitants of the city lives in slums. They lack the property of the land. They, do the, they build their houses through self-construction. They have irregular access to urban services, very cheap reproduction of labor. The, we have very few uh, and efficient residential policies, and that means that large sections of the population are plunged into informality. We have a very high degree of inequality, although it is decreasing. Our Gini coefficient is from, one, from 0.5 to 0.6 sometimes. And we have a um, scenario of micro-segregation, which means that very rich and very poor people live very close to each other. Um, in the last decade, as was pointed out, we have seen a reduction of poverty, and for the first time ever, I would say, inequality. And assistance programs have been expanded. In Brazil, for example, now 11 million people are beneficiaries of um, a transfer, conditional income transfer program called Bolsa Familia. And there has been an increase in the real value of minimum wages. We have a very high incidence of crime, especially lethal violence, as I'm going to show. And homicide rates increased dramatically through the 80s. Uh, most analysts believe this was due to uh, the uh, upsurge of the cocaine market and the introduction of heavy weapons and the territorial control of criminal groups to which I'm going to refer. These are um, homicide rates all from the 80s into the year 2000. You can see that at a certain moment, the homicide rate for the city uh, was close to 80 per 100,000, which is extremely high value. It's the value that we have seen in Honduras, for example, these days. Homicides are concentrated on the north of town and the west of town, which is a very different pattern from robberies, for example, which are concentrated in other richer areas and thefts. Um, the impacts of homicides on the population is extremely high. Uh, we carried out research with 1998 data and we calculated that the average male uh, person born in Rio de Janeiro loses 2.5 years in life expectancy. So every male born in the city will live on average two and a half years less because of um, lethal violence. This lethal violence, as we have seen elsewhere, um, do we have a laser here? We don't do it? Okay. Uh, as we've seen elsewhere, it affects the young people, and particularly black young people. You can see um, the red and the brown and, and the black lines correspond to browns and blacks, and the blue line corresponds to white. So there is a huge increase in the risk of homicides once you get to adolescence, but this risk is particularly intense for the non-white population. And it's particularly high also for single, in other words, non-married black uh, young males. So there is an interaction between marital status, age, and race, whereby if you're a young um, black male, then your chances of being killed are extremely high. Um, we joke sometimes that we were going to try to push for a compulsory marriage policy for young people, um, but we've not been very successful so far. Um, Violence is very concentrated in a few areas. Every dot in the map is the place of residence of one person who was killed in the year 2000. And you can see that those areas are very concentrated around the north and uh, to some degree also to the west of town. So the central trait of criminal activity in Rio is territorial control. Um, as we saw before, we have slums interspersed in the city, people who make uh, $200 a month live 50 meters away from people who make $20,000 a month. Um, this is very distinctive and opposed to the traditional scheme of a center versus periphery um, type of segregation. We also have central versus periphery type of segregation, but there is a much more micro, much more intense micro segregation process. These small territories, these slums, are dominated by armed groups who, for example, process and sell the drugs there, they try to control local markets, or they establish a certain social order. 
The control of these small areas is fiercely disputed by these armed groups. And they need machine guns to defend their territory, and these, of course, result in very high degrees of lethal violence. We have different types of armed groups. I will be um, referring to them very shortly. Some of them are the classic um, drug dealing group. Um, they are organized in networks, which are loose networks formed in jail, and then they spread this control of the territory. I say loose networks because they have no central command, no central organizational planning, but they give each other mutual support in case of uh, invasions or attacks. We also have death squads for social cleansing that kill small criminals and rivals. And we have so-called militias, which are groups composed by state agents, policemen, prison guards, firemen, anybody to whom the state has given a gun is part of these groups. They occupy the slums in their free time, extort inhabitants, and control most economic activities. So most of the armed groups exert territorial control on very small areas. They use heavy weaponry to defend this territory, and this ter territory is under dispute all the time. Some of them sell drugs, and for criminal groups in Rio, drug selling is the base of the business, unlike, for example, in Sao Paulo, where robberies have a much import more important role. They exert also a tyrannical control on the population, so if you live in these areas, you can't go anywhere. You can't dress any color you would like. You can't use any slang you would like. Um, so all your daily activities, even the minor ones, are subjected to the rule of this group and mostly to the rule of one person who will decide how you will talk, what time you will go back home, which territories you can access, and what clothing you will be wearing. We call this situation sometimes neo-feudalism. If you disobey these rules, then you will be told off first time, you will be beaten up, you will be expel, uh, expelled from the community, or you would be killed. Um, so, as I said before, these territorial groups dispute the control of the territory, and in practice, people don't have formal rights. Um, there is also a loss of communal trust, and these criminal groups also um, carry out assistant activities. For example, they pay for parties, they pay for drugs, they pay for burials, they pay for things that the state doesn't cover, and then you go to the drug lord or you go to the head of the militia and they will cover the costs for you. As a result, there is a long continuum between coercion and support. Many people who live in these areas um, hate these groups, but other people support them because they provide these basic needs and because they provide social order, which is very basic for anybody, but exactly for those people who live in these areas, somebody who to provide social control. To the point that sometimes when the state arrests some of the drug uh, lords or the leaders of the militias, people in these communities will complain and say, well now, who are we going to go over when we have a problem, when we have a um, crime, when we have something to, to decide? So there is a history of authoritarian social control internalized by victims who have been socialized in this way, and they have seen no, no other way. The, the rule of law has never been applied in these territories. So local leaders and residents association leaders are killed sometimes or threatened or integrated into the criminal groups. Um, in order to be tolerated, at least they have to make sure they don't disturb um, the business of these groups. Often they are asked to mediate between the state and these armed groups. And then the state asks them to mediate, but the very state that asks them that will stigmatize them and associate them with criminal groups and with organized crime. So these armed groups make it impossible to generate an independent political leadership and political change. We also have the militias, which, as I said, are composed by policemen, by um, prison guards, by marine corps um, members, and they also control small territories. They impose taxes on the population, some of them called protection taxes, and some of them are taxes on um, the basin, local businesses. They create coercive monopolies, so you can only buy water from them, you can only get um, cable TV from them, and so on and so forth. They also tend to um, provide a legitimization discourse linked to law and order. So they will say, we are here to liberate you from the drug dealers, we're going to make you free, but by the way, you have to pay um, the amount we request. Um, there are some 
differences and many similarities uh, between these groups. Uh, the first column is the militias, second drug dealers, and the third are the death squads. All of them exert territorial control, even though the death squads do not exert full territorial control. For example, if you go to an area controlled by a death squad, they will not be, the members will not be on the entrance checking who comes in and out, but still they will make sure that people who perform undesirable activities will be um, taken care of. Coercion is present in all cases. The economic motivation, of course, is the center of the job, so to say. There is a legitimization discourse only in the case of militias, and this has been decreasing. Um, state agents like policemen are part of all these groups, but there are differences. For example, in the case of militias, policemen are the leaders of these groups. In the case of drug dealers, uh, policemen are bribed by these groups. And in the case of death squads, the service policemen are members of these death squads, but their services are hired by other political or social groups. Militias are better organized and they control all economic activities. Drug dealers are composed of younger uh, kids who use weapons also for symbolic value. They feel very strong with their weapons, whereas militia members are far more professional. And death squads are often directed by tradesmen or politicians. So how does this state um, respond to these very serious situation. What policies does it implement? If we can call them policies at all, because the policy is supposed to be planned, evaluated, and it's not the case in most um, situations in Rio de Janeiro. Um, state response is mostly repressive that rather than preventive. It's reactive rather than proactive. And it's based basically on the war on crime or the war on drugs, which takes place, of course, in the slums. The state response is strongly militarized, training, doctrine, tactics, armored vehicles, everything is militarized, so much so that many people believe the problem is a problem of caliber. If we had stronger caliber, more powerful weapons, we would defeat these armed groups. Um, it's so militarized that when we have a crisis, what do we do? We call the army in, of course, as we do have now in some areas of the city. We have military justice and military regulations in the disciplinary uh, regulations for the police. Um, the intervention of the state is extremely violent too. This is a research we carried out in the mid-90s on police use of lethal force. You can see in red the number of people killed, in blue the number of people wounded. So you can see it's far more likely to be killed than to be wounded by police in these armed shootouts. You can compare, you can see the, here different cities and in US cities of course you have more people wounded than people killed. In Rio you have many more people killed than people wounded. Um, in many US cities, we have less than 5% of homicides originating from police intervention. In Rio and Sao Paulo, we have above 10% of all homicides originated from police interventions. Um, this is the index of lethality. We divide the number of people killed by the number of people wounded. And you can see the scale. The US is below one, which is what we expect, more people wounded than people killed. Buenos Aires is almost two, Jamaica is above two, and Rio de Janeiro is close to three people killed for every person wounded in police and armed encounters. Um, we even had a, pol a policy in the mid-90s in Rio whereby policemen who killed got rewarded, and they increased their salary 50%, um, 75%, up to 150%. Um, and you can see the result, of course, People, t uh, police tend to kill a lot more when they were rewarded for it, unsurprisingly. This war on, drive, uh, war on drugs uh, is focused on drug dealing peddlers who take the brunt of repression. Uh, rarely do we see investigations that uncover white collar crime, although there are clear evidence of the connection between the low level violent networks and the high level criminality networks. Um, there is also evidence of the link between police violence and corruption, um, and the extreme violence of state agents actually fuels further violence. So much so that the response of the state is actually part of the problem, not just um, a solution or unlike a solution. Um, the periodical invasion of slums with heavy gunfire left uh, many people wounded uh, and killed, and uh, police carried out uh, often human rights violations like torture, summary executions, and the legitimacy of police among poor communities was very low. Um, so the public policies 
I'm talking about the traditional model. And then later, in the last few minutes, I will tell you about the novelty of the last few years. But the traditional policies had as a target the protection, not of the people who lived in the slums, but rather the victory of the war on crimes. Um, so there was a priority also of fighting one main criminal network, which is the Commando Vermelho of the last few governments. And the state action actually fed into the vicious circle of violence. So we didn't have a war in formal terms because we didn't have clear sides uh, and the so-called enemy always recruited from the population. Wars have to be temporary. Somebody has to win a war and there has to be a peace agreement. Um, and this is a permanent situation and there are no specific objectives. So it is clearly not a war. But uh, even if it's not a war in conceptual terms, it's clearly a war in its consequences. High victimization, heavy weaponry, displacement of population, lack of access to medical services, and severe humanitarian effects. Victims of stray bullets in slums are sometimes treated as collateral damage by uh, public officials. And as sociologists say, if something is socially defined as real, it is real in its consequences. So in the consequences, we do have a war. The metaphor of the war is used for several purposes. One of them is as a justification for committing human rights violation. People think that because we are at war, anything is valid. They don't seem to have read the Geneva Conventions very thoroughly. Um, so from 2009, we have a new set of policies that try to change that partially. Among them, I will be citing the pacifying police units, which are based on police saturation, permanence of the same policemen in the same communities, a more com community-oriented policing doctrine, and the recruitment of new policemen. I believe that in other panels, there will be a further attention to this, so I will not, be, I will not deal too extensively on it. There was also a policy to create targets for police groups and to reward them according to their performance. All of these experiments in Latin America have, to some degree, an origin in CompSat model in New York. And in fact, this policy was very instrumental in reducing homicides in general and police homicides in particular. Then there was a creation of a division of homicides in the capital, and they claim they uh, achieved a higher clearance rate for homicides. We haven't seen the data. The data is not very clear, but they claim that they have higher clearance rates. And we did see a very clear reduction of homicides in Rio from 2008 to 2012, and also a parallel reduction <coughs> of robberies, that is, armed crimes. So I will tell you very briefly about these police pacifying units, UPPs. We carried out an evaluation in 2012, and we estimated that there was a reduction in violent deaths of up to 48% in these communities where the project was implemented. This model uh, controlled for the evolution of homicides in the rest of the city. So this is the net effect of the UPP project. There was a parallel increase in non-lethal and unarmed crime, partially due to reduced under-reporting rates. In other words, people who never went to the police to report a crime now, not only do they go, but also the police, if there is trouble, will take them to the police station to report the crime. So there's a, a huge increase in reporting rates. And also because with the absence of these very authoritarian, tyrannical head of the drug dealers group or the militia group, then there's nobody to um, keep these kind of very authoritarian control. So this may have led to an increase in minor crime. This was for us, above all, an opportunity to reform police and police policies and to leave behind the war on drugs. Um, this UPP intervention was very selective in territorial and in social terms. And in my evaluation, not only mine, but a group of people, we think that this fits in very well with the project that the government had for Rio. They wanted to turn Rio into an international center of tourism and services. This is the uh, statistical model. You can see that for every, this is pre-post, uh, but this is the net effect. You can see that in every community, we have half a death per month due to the project. So that means that six lives are being saved in every community every year because of the project. Um, in terms of rate, the reduction in rates is approximately 60 per 100,000, which is a huge reduction in homicide rates. This is the number of people killed by police. You can see that it increased steadily from 98 into 2007, and then it started decreasing. And after 2009, 2010, 
there was a very strong decrease, and whereas in 2007 the police killed 1,300 people every year, the last two years the police have killed 400. It's, it's still a very high number, but it's about a third of what we used to have. So in some, in some communities they say that these pacifying units mean that the police are pacifying themselves. And this is where the UPPs are located. Uh, the map is not very good, but in yellow you can see the location. And if you bear that in mind, and you can see the, um, er the most violent areas of town, you can see that the most violent areas are in the north and the west, whereas the UPPs are in the center and the south, and they're slowly going to the north. Um, now we are in a very strong crisis lately. Uh, homicides have been increasing in some areas, like the Bashada Fluminense, since 2012, and in the state as a whole since 2013. So after a few years of a strong decrease, we are now again um, on the increase. Robberies also increased over the last year, and in our opinion, there is an exhaustion of the positive impact of the old policies. The policies have not been evaluated, and they have not been adjusted for several years. You can see the trend here uh, in red is the overall state, and you can see that after many years declining, it started increasing in 2013. We have a partial loss of legitimacy of the UPPs in the present moment. There was a very famous case in which uh, somebody was tortured, disappeared, and killed by the police in Rosinha, called the Amarildo case, and this was very important in diminishing the degree of legitimacy for the project. We also have a lack of progress in police reform, unfortunately. Uh, there's a lack of significant change in training and overall doctrine. So in some areas we have the pacification doctrine. In the rest of the town on the, of the state, we have the old doctrine of armed confrontation. There are two pieces of research that show that most policemen who work in the UPPs would rather not work in the UPPs. They would rather work in the traditional battalions. So there's a, a lack of internal legitimacy of the project. And there is also an absence of a strategy to merge the UPPs